Welcome to Laughter and the Law, where we talk about the law with a lighthearted twist. Hey, this is Jackie Hauser with Flexner Hauser Injury Law. And this is Diane, her trusty sidekick and office manager. Who knows nothing about insurance or law. I mean, <laughs> I'm a lawful citizen. I gotta know something. Oh my goodness. She is a great office manager and she is our guinea pig whenever we have to try to explain things. We'll say, let me explain this to you and see if you understand. I mean, how many times do you tell me something and I'm wide-eyed and I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> how? <laughs> Why? So one thing you've never done is you've never been to a jury trial. No, I've never been. Well, I've never been to a civil jury trial. I did go for one day to a criminal jury trial. Okay. Just one day. But I thought you were going to say, I've never been called to be a juror. Oh. I, and I haven't. Okay. I've ne- and I don't know if it's because I did a lot of moving around, mm-hmm. like in my 20s. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, never have been called, never been summoned. So, and you know what? That's funny because I've been in Wilmington less than five years and I've been summoned twice. Interesting. <laughs> Wow. Lived everywhere else. Only it's the rest of my life I was summoned once. Lived here for less than five years. I'm summoned twice. Wow. Uh, I'm looking forward to it when it finally happens. Yeah, I t- hope it's not in an opportune time. Take a sign that says, pick me. They like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They like that. Okay. I will tell you a funny story. So I was picking a jury one time, and this young man was at jury duty. He was in a full-on suit. I mean, looked nice. Mm-hmm. Looked nice. And whenever we were asking him questions during voir dire, which means to speak the truth, and voir dire is whenever the attorneys get to ask the jury questions and decide who they want to keep, and we can take off a certain number of people. So whenever we're asking him the questions, he tells us, you know, he wasn't in college, but he says, I want to be a lawyer. I want to go to law school, and I think this would be a great experience. And so, you know, I came here today. I'm excited about being on the jury. <laughs> and the, the other side kicked him off (laughs) oh poor guy well here's the law and i knew what his logic was it wasn't by no means to be mean or disrespectful but you don't want potential lawyers on your jury because you don't want lawyers on your jury you know potentially they're sitting there questioning everything why didn't they do this why didn't they bring this evidence why didn't they say this why didn't they ask this why didn't they call this witness you know (laughs) So, Mm. so as much as you know i probably wouldn't want maybe Maybe if the lawyer was my best friend and I thought they wouldn't be fair to the other side, I might <laughs> keep them. But then I think the other side would probably kick them off. So anyway. I, I, guess, I guess there's some reasoning with that, too, of if you are going to be judged by a jury of your peers, you want people to be just as uninformed, I guess, about the process as you are? Yeah, we can go there. You know, back whenever the jury system was first introduced, you know, it was all white males who were on the jury. And one of the requirements was you had to know something about the case. You couldn't be uninformed. Oh. And if you didn't know anything about the case, then why are you here, for goodness sake, you know? So, uh-huh. but that has changed with our system. And now if you know something about the case, we think, oh, well, then you're biased or we have to flesh all that out. Yeah. So a jury trial is really interesting. And it's, the, you know, the most important part of your case is selection of your jury because, you know, you're trying to look for people that are impartial, but also people that will be able to listen to the evidence and render a verdict. And so it's a very interesting process because both sides are asking questions and trying to agree on these 12 people that we're going to keep in this box and and hear all the evidence. We were chatting in the office the other day about a jury trial and some things that were coming up. And I think I made the comment off the cuff as we were talking about the case. I was like, well, the jury will never hear that. And it kind of piqued your interest. Yeah. And you were like, what do you mean they'll never hear that? And I was like, oh, there's things that a jury never hears. The jury doesn't know. Oh, um, and there's certain things that are specifically kept from the jury. Same thing. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, like, yes, yeah, some evidence may not make it in. But what I mean is there's some things they purposely will not tell the jury. And I don't even know if you're covering this day because like, we could talk about this on multiple podcasts. Yeah. Like days and days worth of discussion. We won't, we won't cover all the points no. today by but no means. I think, And I may be jumping the gun, and I'm sorry if this is not one of your top three that you're talking about today. Okay. But I think I remember vaguely you said something like, especially in this criminal case where I, I sat in on one day, you said the jury doesn't know what the punishment of each charge is, like whether right. it's for life or just five to six years, or if he's a, 
you know, be listed somewhere or that kind of a thing. Right. Well, that's a criminal trial. And what I learned, because I don't do criminal work, I was just helping with this criminal trial. Mm -hmm. And I don't do criminal work. And I can't say that loudly enough. And I said it to my client 3,000 times. And I told him I was going to get a T-shirt that said that as well. But, you know, I was there for a specific reason, not because of my criminal trial prowess or my criminal jury trial prowess. But what I learned in that criminal trial is that a civil trial and a criminal trial are vastly different. Vastly. The rules are different. It's just tremendously different. But even on the civil trial, and that's another topic for another day because I got a book in the works about that. Yeah. But even on the civil side, which is where I have my experience, there are things that a jury will not know. And there's reasons for it, and there's rules for it. Sometimes you think, oh, but it would help the jury out so much if they knew this piece of information. And the other side may say, no, it won't. And so then the judge and the courts and the rules of court have to determine if it would be fair for the jury to know. So we're just going to talk about a couple of things that the jury never knows. Yeah, yeah, and I think that... Yeah, this is this is going to be so interesting. I'm super excited. I don't even know what the top three ones that you're choosing for today are, but I am ex- super excited to talk about them. Well, let's talk about the first one then. Okay. Jury never knows whether or not someone was wearing a seatbelt. Oh. Never. Now, never is an extreme term. Um, if it's not important, then they may know. But if I have a client who wasn't wearing a seatbelt, and they broke their leg, then the other side can't argue, well, if you'd have been wearing a seatbelt, you wouldn't have broke your leg. So then you are somewhat... Contributory negligence. That's the word. That's the C word I was looking for. Can you say it one more time for us? Contributory negligence. Oh, it's a C N word. Yeah. Contributory negligence. So the the defense wants to argue, well, you contributed to your injuries because you didn't protect yourself in the seatbelt. Whenever really and truly, you could have been killed in the seatbelt. You could have had a head injury because, you know, the car rolled or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you could have been dead and had a head injury or you could have snapped your neck or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to know that in the biomechanics of the way that the accident happens. Yeah, we could play coulda, shoulda, woulda all day if we wanted to. Right. So the jury just never knows about whether or not somebody was wearing a seatbelt or not wearing a seatbelt and their injuries were more severe because of that. Okay, and I mean, obviously this is for a civil case. Right, which is all we're going to talk about is civil trials. (laughs) Uh, So before we move on, can we just describe what is a civil case? What falls under the category of a civil case? Right. Civil cases have to do with any type of injury where, you know, either, number one, somebody's denied your claim or they haven't offered you what you believe is sufficient for the value of your claim. And so if it's a personal injury claim, an auto case, maybe you got bit by a dog, maybe you slipped and fell, maybe you were at a restaurant, you fell out of your chair because the chair broke. Any case where a crime hasn't been committed, now you can have a civil case, you know, there can be assault and battery at the criminal level, and then you can file an assault and battery case at the civil level. There's an intentional tort called assault, an intentional tort called battery. Sometimes people contact me about those and they want to file a civil case. But on those kind of cases, my fee is different than in civil cases where there's insurance. Mm -hmm. If there's insurance, then I'll usually just take a contingency fee, mainly because I know I'm going to get paid from the insurance company. Or I'm willing to take the gamble. Let me put it that way. Because if if my client doesn't get paid, then I don't get paid. So I'm like, I'm with you. Let's take this gamble. Let's go down this road together. I want to get paid. I want you to get paid. In an assault and battery kind of thing, typically there wouldn't be insurance to cover that unless somebody has an umbrella policy, which would cover intentional torts. So usually those kind of cases would not be contingency cases and you get paid by the hour or get paid a retainer. So that's a civil case. Auto accidents, wrongful death cases. Would this be workers' comp too or no? It could be. You could have a workers' comp claim, which is parallel to your civil case. And we have a lot of those. We have folks who were injured on the job while they're driving around in their, you know, truck for their employer. And so then they get in an auto accident. So they not only have a workers' comp case, but they also have a civil case. Or we have folks who were injured on the job because a piece of machinery failed. So they have a workers' comp case, and then we have a products liability case against the manufacturer of that machinery. Mm. Okay. 
All right, so now that we're all on the same page of what a civil case is, and we're talking about specifically what jurors at a civil trial do not know, the first one obviously has to do with any kind of auto accident. Right. We don't know whether or not they wore a seatbelt or not because more than likely it doesn't matter in the whole scope of evidence. Well, the courts have said that, you know, that's not going to be an issue for the jury to determine the injured person's contributory negligence, whether or not they were or weren't wearing a seatbelt. Mm. You know, the laws could change next week, but that's just what it has been ever since we've had the seatbelt law. And even before the seatbelt law, you couldn't argue it. Even before seatbelts were mandatory, you couldn't argue that they were or were not wearing a seatbelt to refute that they contributed to their injuries or their injuries could have been prevented. Okay, all All right. right. So what's the second one? Second one is kind of a... You know, it's a little circular in its reasoning, and we have a whole lot of rules and a whole lot of case law about it, but here's the rule. The rule is relevant evidence is admissible. Hold on, what, what, what? Relevant evidence is admissible. Okay, what, is, what does admissible mean? Admissible in court, so the jury can hear it. Okay, so relevant evidence can be heard by the jurors. It is admissible, yes. Irrelevant evidence is inadmissible. So if it's irrelevant, jury's not going to hear it. Right. So the magic question then is... What is relevant? What is relevant? What is relevant? And thus begins many a legal argument. (laughs) And that's why you have so many attorneys that will say, objection, relevance. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I've seen those movies. Yeah. That's right. Objection, Your Honor. What is the relevance to this question? Yeah. Now, there are some exceptions to that because there is case law that says even if it's relevant, it doesn't have to be admissible. Mm. But getting away from those exceptions and those outliers, that is a big argument. And a lot of times we have to cross that bridge to get to what is relevant. I'm going to read to you some fancy wording here from our rules of court. Oh, Maybe I should take a swig of coffee first. Because I thought your next argument was going to be, well, what is relevant evidence? So Yeah, yeah. What is relevant evidence? Okay. Thank you for letting me prompt you with that question. <laughs> well, I mean, I said it a minute yeah. ago. Like, what is relevant? So relevant evidence, and I sound kind of drunk whenever I say that. Relevant evidence. Well, yeah, yeah. Make sure you enunciate, <laughs> yeah, please. I do need to enunciate over that. Relevant, relevant evidence. evidence means... Evidence having any tendency to make the existence of any fact that is of consequence to the determination of the action more probable or less probable than it would be without the evidence. I mean, I understood all of that. But it almost sounds so cumbersome. Like, why would you make it so difficult to explain that? But in a way, it's also the most concise way to say it. So it's like you read it or hear it and go, okay, I think I understand. And you have to read it again or hear it again to be like, yeah, I think I got all that. Yeah. So basically, if it has to do with any fact that is of consequence to the outcome of the action. Yeah. And that's where you want to argue it is that this fact is of consequence to the outcome of the action. It may be three doors removed from it but if you can take the court down that path and say Mm -hmm. this is important because we have to go through this door and this door and this door Mm -hmm. but it's a very big argument you know especially whenever we get into litigation and they want a bunch of stuff admitted into court you know i wanted in there that that she's always been a drunk and she was a drunk and and i think she was drinking that day Mm. well if she's always been a drunk that's probably not relevant to this action. This is why sometimes defense attorneys will request an additional like 10 years of medical record history from our clients. They try to, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The limit by case law is five, but they do try to get their prior records so they can say, oh, you had a back injury and 2015, you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) haven't been to the doctor since then. Oh, well, you used to be a smoker, so yeah. of course. Yeah. So. yeah. so how can we say that lung damage is from the accident yeah. instead of from your smoking? That's a great example. So with the fact that you were previously were a smoker or currently are a smoker, yeah, would that be relevant, you know, whenever someone says, oh, well, if you weren't a smoker, you would have healed up faster? Yeah. 
you know, because everybody knows that smoking inhibits your oxygenation. So yeah. that's a good example of that. So it sounds boring, but I'm telling you, many a legal fight is fought about the relevance of facts. And so you don't want to get down in the weeds with that because you don't want to make the jury or the judge angry at you. Mm -hmm. You really do want to stick to what is the issue that we're addressing here? What are we trying to determine? And then what facts will help us determine that? May I kind of sort of go off on a rabbit trail? I think it's relevant to what we're talking about. Ooh, relevant. Okay. (laughs) So I vaguely remember whenever you're preparing for trial, there are sometimes whenever you have to meet with the judge prior to selecting the jury to get certain evidence forward or right. included. Is this similar to the relevance? You've got to prove relevance yeah, with case because, study and stuff? Absolutely, because we have these pretrial motions. Okay, pretrial motions. We try to get all this stuff kind of hammered out before trial so it doesn't slow down the trial. So we can yeah. just kind of hammer through the trial, boom, boom, boom. And we know what the rules are. We all know what the rules are that are printed in the rule books and all that kind of stuff. But then whenever you get specific to the evidence of your case, you do have these pretrial motions with the judge about things that you want excluded or included in the evidence. And you kind of hammer all that out ahead of time. Okay, so you said pretrial motions and you just said excluded and included. But what is the definition of a motion? A motion is a request before the court for them to make a decision about something consequential to your case. So it's like a formal request. Yes. Okay. It can be in writing or it can be oral. If it's oral, it has to be on the record. So you got to have a court reporter there. Okay. Okay. So that's why I see you file a lot of motions prior to trial as well, because you're trying to hurry up and get that done before you actually are in front of the judge. Right. Absolutely. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So you may be going back and forth for a few days about what can be included, what can't be included. And, of course, you haven't chosen your jury yet, so they don't know about all of these pieces of the puzzle that may or may not be in the box at the end. Yeah, a lot of your cases are won in pretrial motions and in jury selection. Interesting. Because then you know what your evidence is going to be or not be, and you know who's in that box. Yeah. And so a lot of times you know where you are in those two places. Wow. Yeah. Even it's not verdict day, it's pretrial motion day and it's jury selection. Cuz you basically know what your ammo is mm-hmm. and who may be on your side up there in the box. Yeah. Or who you may be able to win to your side. Are you feeling good about the 12 folks in the box? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right, so that's number 2. Yeah, and we're getting on some side trails, so we're going to do like two more, and there's a thousand of them. Oh, we're doing two more, so more than three. Well, we'll one or two. Well, let's see how long we chat on the next one. Okay, all right. I'm excited. Let's go. So the next one. Okay. If the at-fault party, right, I'm representing the plaintiff, they were injured, they weren't at fault. If the at-fault party, whoever they were, whether it was a premises liability, products liability, in this example, I'm going to use an example about an auto case. Okay. So if the at-fault party who caused the accident received a citation. Okay, and a citation is? A, a traffic ticket. Okay, okay, okay. They received a citation. Sometimes the citation is, congratulations, that's not this. <laughs> <laughs> the citation is, you ran the red light. <laughs> so this would be like a speeding ticket, or even if like they were a DUI or DWI, would that be a citation? No, that comes more criminal. Okay, sorry, sorry, go ahead. So more like a safe movement violation, fair to yield whenever they hit you in the rear, okay. fair to stop at the stop sign. Reckless driving. Mm, no, 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 no. That gets punitive. Ah, oh, okay, sorry. Just typical little old citation. Okay. Ran the red light, ran the stop sign, ferry to yield, hit somebody in the rear. They receive a traffic citation. They have to go to traffic court. Okay. If that citation is dismissed, and a lot of times it gets dismissed, if that citation is dismissed... In traffic court. In traffic court. Not in your trial. Right. Yeah, this okay. is long before trial. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. The jury never knows that they got a citation. Oh. So a lot of times, whenever I talk to juries after the trial, see, I can't get up there and go, I want to tell you about the citation they got. Yeah. <laughs> and then their insurance company got it dismissed. And I can't. Mm. Because it now, was dismissed. Why, how would that influence the jury's decision? Because sometimes whenever I'm talking to jurors after the trial, whenever I can go back and gather information from them and say, hey, how do we do? You know, what were you thinking? A lot of times they'll say, 
Well, he didn't even get a traffic ticket. And I'm like, oh, but he did. But he did. Oh, but he did. And his insurance company wrote a letter to the DA and said, hey, he's got insurance coverage that'll cover the bodily injury claim. And so then the DA just dismisses the citation. Okay, so, I mean, 10,000 foot view, I get it. But give me an example here. I'm not saying like from your past clients. Let's say that I have hit that van of 10 people that you're representing. Okay. And we're in court and I got, what can I get a citation for again? Failure to yield? Failure to yield. Let's say failure to yield. Okay. Okay. So I got that. Failure to yield the right of way to a vehicle. Yeah. Okay. And... Wait, wait, wait. I would have to have higher coverage, too, for you to want to go to trial, because you don't want to go to trial for 30, 60, right? Well, maybe there's some UIM out there. Okay, yeah, yeah, maybe there's, okay. <laughs> Let's so, hope and pray there's UIM. <laughs> there's more money out there available, and they're <laughs> holding on to it. So I wouldn't go to trial on a UIM case. I'd go to arbitration, but let's just keep going with this example. <laughs> <laughs> so walk me through, like, how, how would it make a difference to the jury that I got a citation or not? Because some jurors don't want to penalize you as the defendant because you didn't get a citation. They're just like, oh, the poor guy over there, he didn't get a citation. I mean, if there would have been a citation, surely they would have told us about it. So, I'm sorry, maybe I'm just being super thick in the skull today. But at the trial, you're saying she hit them. Look at these pictures of this damage. Mm -hmm. Look at all these medical records. Look at this kid that's not going to play softball because his knee will never work again. Okay. And you're giving all of this evidence, and then I'm over here being like, well, I don't even know what the defense would say about that, but the defense can't. Let me get, here's a good example. Here's a good example. We just had this case. We just settled this case. We had two clients in a vehicle that were rear-ended at a high rate of speed. Mm Mm-hmm rear-ended. They had to be transported by ambulance. They had several years of treatment. The fellow that hit them got a citation and his insurance company had it dismissed. So they wouldn't settle with us. We filed a lawsuit. We served discovery on him, which is just a way of asking questions back and forth in writing. And one of my questions to him was, tell me in your own words how the accident happened. And what he says is, your client slammed on brakes, and I didn't have time to stop. Well, that was a big, fat lie. It was a big, fat lie by the witnesses at the scene. It was a big, fat lie because that's not what he told the officer within two seconds of the officer getting there. Don't you think if that's what happened, that's the first thing I'm telling the officer is, oh, my God, these people slammed on brakes, and I didn't have time to stop. Mm -hmm. No, what he tells the officer is, I never saw him. Hmm. And the officer put it in the report. Thank you, Lord. Because the officer said, driver of vehicle one says he never saw him. Hmm. Not driver of vehicle one says they slammed on brakes. So driver of vehicle one gets a ticket, which then gets dismissed. But see, then if he comes to trial, what's he going to say? He's going to say what he's written in that discovery. He's going to say, oh, they slammed on brakes. And you can't reference the citation anymore. I can't reference the citation. I can't ask the officer about the citation. I can't ask him about the citation. I can't say, didn't your insurance company get the citation dismissed? And what it can do is put doubt, and I've got to convince 12 people, not one person, not three. I got to convince 12 people. And if I got one person sitting there going, oh, well, Ms. Hauser didn't mention that they slammed on brakes. Oh, see, okay, that, that shows me just how, Yeah. wow. So, you know, that's where it gets to be really important that, you know, there's pluses and minuses to it, mm-hmm. obviously. But a citation in a situation like that where you're going to change your story Mm -hmm. 18 months down the road, oh, all of a sudden I've had time to think about it. Mm -hmm. And so now it's, oh, y'all slammed on brakes. Mm -mm. No, we didn't. If we would have, you'd have said that first thing. You would have said that. That needs to change. (laughs) Well, that's just one of those rules. We can't change the rules, but that's just one of those rules. But, but. If enough voices come together, we could change the rules. I mean, unified voices change laws all the time. 
Okay. We got to influence the judicial system. That's the problem with the judicial system, though, is because they make a lot of the rulings based on precedent. Yes. And if there isn't precedent, then they do it by law. So, or well, they do it by law, and if there isn't law, then they look at the precedent, or yeah. vice versa, whatever. A little bit of both. So you have all this precedent now, so you would have to have, like, a major law change to get them to not rely on that precedent. Or right? have to go back to relevance and make it relevant about why we wanted that admissible, and that's just an argument that you typically don't win. And you, so you it can't goes back say, to that relevance. You can't argument. say to the judge like he lied in his discovery because of the citation that was dismissed. Because he's not going to say he lied. He's going to say the officer was wrong. He's going to say a, a thousand other excuses mm. other than that. Yeah. You want one more? Can we do one more? Oh, oh, let's do one more. This is a bonus. <laughs> Let's do a bonus one. I'm not going to charge extra. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> whether or not that defendant sitting over there in the jury, whether or not that defendant has liability insurance is not admissible. Okay. So what? <laughs> yeah. What? So the rule actually says, the actual wording of the rule says, it's not admissible whether or not that defendant acted negligently or wrongfully. Right. But still, you can't open the door because if we open the door, then we go back to the relevance argument. Why is this relevant, Your Honor? I'll throw in a bonus on the bonus. That lawyer that that defendant has representing them was hired by their insurance company. Mm. That's all they do is represent that insurance company at trial. They're not representing the man. They're representing the insurance company. They're, they got a dual representation, yeah. but they didn't get hired by Joe Smith. Yeah. They got hired by XYZ Insurance Company. Yeah. So literally, I knew a lawyer one time that did defense work, and the only way he referred to his client was as the defendant because he did so many trials, he didn't know who his clients were. Hmm. But that lawyer representing the defendant was hired by the insurance company. Jury never knows that. Okay, but the first bonus you gave me, the jury doesn't know whether that defendant has liability insurance? Has automobile insurance. They don't know whether that person has automobile insurance or how much they have. Okay. That's never admitted in court. On your side, how do you think that would be helpful? Why do you think they should know that? Or do you agree with this ruling? I think it would be helpful in that... Uh, it, it's a two-edged sword. I mean, if, if it came out that this person only had a $30,000 policy and I got a person sitting here with a million dollars in damages, then that's going to hurt me. But it would be helpful in that a lot of times the way that defendants work their cases is it's the, oh, woe is me. Oh, here I am, Joe Schmo. I work as a sales rep at a local retail store and I make, you know, $18 an hour. And then it gets to, you know, the pity party, and the jury gets back there, and you get a couple of them that are feeling sorry for Joe Schmo. They and identify they it's, more with Joe Schmo than they do with my clients. Yeah, and they think it's person against person instead of person against insurance company. Exactly, exactly. And believe me, I guarantee you, Joe Schmo does not want to be sitting in that courtroom either. He wants to be out there enjoying his life, doing whatever he does Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Yeah. He doesn't want to be sitting there. The insurance company has made him sit there as well yeah. because they don't want to pay a claim. But how much he has for insurance or whether or not he has insurance is not admissible. The lawyer that's been hired by the insurance company, not admissible. Well, if he doesn't have insurance, why is he there being represented by someone who is representing the insurance company? Well, let me correct myself. If he doesn't have insurance, then clearly he doesn't have a lawyer. Okay. Yeah. So clearly so, if there's a lawyer sitting there, somebody's hired the lawyer. So we're saying underinsured at this point? No, 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 no. I can't even think of a situation where a defendant has gone out and hired their own private counsel unless they were like a family member or something. Mm -hmm. But no, typically if there's a lawyer there, it's typically been hired by the insurance company. There's an insurance company somewhere involved. So so basically what you're saying is is that they just don't know how much is available right. to award your client. Who? Who is they? The jury doesn't know how much money or how much is in the pot the, the jury doesn't know there's a pot. Okay. They don't even know there's insurance. Mm. So they don't know that there's insurance. They don't know where this attorney came from. You know, a lot of times, so, the, like if we got a trial down here in Wilmington and all of a sudden the defense attorney's from Raleigh, 
you're like, what's a Raleigh attorney doing down here in Wilmington? Wow, you know. So the jury is thinking the money is coming out of the pocket of the defendant. Bingo. There we go. Okay. I have now picked up what you have put down. Okay. Good deal. <laughs> Good deal. Okay. Those are just four things. You know, there's many others, and we can talk about them. It's things that I wish I could get up in opening statements and say, let me just cut to the chase about a couple of issues and just check them off. And could we you, just can't. Could you not, in your opening, say, you are not going to hear about this, you're not going to know about this, you're not going to know about this? And I'm not saying, like, specifically, the, like, the information, but, like, you are not going to hear how much insurance there is available. You're not going to hear if there was a citation or not. You're not going to hear blah, 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 blah. Can, can, you say, can you say that? No. You can't even hint at that? No. You can't even, like, shine a flashlight over in that dark corner? <laughs> I definitely couldn't do what you've just said. Okay. There may be times where you can be a bit more obtuse, Mm-hmm. But you got to be careful about that because that can get you in trouble with the judge. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to play dirty either. So we well, also don't want to have a mistrial. Oh, yeah. And so, oh, let's talk about that. Oh, What's a mistrial? A mistrial is when you mess up. Somebody <laughs> messes up and you go home and you start all over and you make a judge mad because the judge hates nothing more than wasting the court's time. So, you know, we know these rules are in place. And so I would never do what you just suggested without verifying it with the court. Those are just four things. There's more that we could talk about. You know, I don't want to have a three hour <laughs> a three hour podcast, but those are just a couple and we'll talk about some more maybe in a later edition. I'm already looking forward to it. All right. Thanks so much for tuning in. All right, we'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for listening to Laughter in the Law, where we talk about the law with a lighthearted twist. <laughs>